Good evening and welcome to RFL. I am Richard French. We now have just 49 days left in the Trump presidency and the legal issues, they're piling up as he gets ready to exit the White House, whether he likes it or not. Newly unsealed court documents show the Justice Department is investigating whether or not money was funneled to the White House in exchange for a pardon. Now, those documents, they're heavily redacted, so we don't have any names as of yet. Prosecutors, they were granted warrants to access emails and other communications that could have been protected by attorney-client privilege. Now, after they told the judge that they believe bribery, including substantial political contributions, could be involved. Now, the president, of course, he called this what else but fake news. And in other pardon news, because of course there's always more, the New York Times is reporting that the president, he is talking about issuing preemptive pardons to his three oldest kids, plus his favorite attorney, Rudy Giuliani, and son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Trump is concerned that a Biden Justice Department could go after them, even though Biden to this point has said he wants to move on. And it is worth noting that those pardons would only apply to federal crimes, not state or local cases, and in the Trump in the administration, the kids could particularly have some legal exposure, as in New York, multiple probes of the Trump organization are ongoing. And for more on this, let's bring in our first guest, Stephen Mulroy. He, a former federal prosecutor, he now a law professor at the University of Memphis. Okay, first off, the idea of preemptive pardoning, um, we may not like it, but it's accepted that that is comes with the power of the presidency. But my question is, how much could it be complicated if any of the principals, let's say family members, were at all involved in a facilitation with this allegation of a, of a pay-for-play pardon scheme here? Would that possibly exempt them from being basically exuved, excused of all criminal wrongdoing if it came to pass that they had a role? If... The evidence showed that they themselves engaged in bribery to obtain their own pardon. Then there might be an argument for invalidating the pardon. That's kind of um, unknown territory. But short of that, the, the president has very broad discretion in pardoning, and he can pardon people uh, even who haven't been charged with the crime yet preemptively. Uh, so even if it looks uh, fishy, that wouldn't necessarily mean that it would be legally invalid. Short of actual proof that that particular pardon was obtained by that person through corrupt means. Now, we get to the issue of um, self-pardon, and I know this is unsettled law right now. But to the layperson, the idea that a person is above the law, even a president. It doesn't seem to jive, at least with any written law that I've seen. Do we have clarity on whether or not a president can basically say, I'm in the clear here? Um, I, I know I guess he could step aside and have the vice president uh, do that in his capacity as then acting president. But short of that, can the president basically excuse his own behavior? It is, as you pointed out correctly, Richard, an unsettled question of law. It's never been tried before. The courts never had occasion to rule on it one way or another. Uh, there is general uh, agreement that the pardon power is broad, that attempts by the other branches to circumscribe it, you know, raise significant separation of powers issues. There's nothing in the text of the Constitution that limits the pardon power, nothing that says that he couldn't pardon himself. So I think there's a fair argument that he would have the uh, ability to self-pardon, although it's not 100% it's not clear because it's uh, virgin territory. Um we saw on the same day um, that Bill Barr said that there was no uh, there there as it relates to voter fraud, um, also uh, drops this case in front of us um, that uh, we don't know who, we don't know the details, nor am I going to presuppose, but that there was enough there um, that they're moving forward because they believe they have some credible evidence um, in this pay for pardon scheme. I should also mention the Durham probe moves on. That all said, Read between the lines for me. What does that tell you? Well, you know, we don't really know for sure, right? But, uh, you know, the fact that all these things happen on the same day, it's possible that it's not coincidence. It's possible that, um, for example, 
on the same day that he comes out with an announcement about a lack of uh, any significant reason to doubt the outcome of the election, which of course would be displeasing to the president. He also on the same day makes an announcement that he's appointing, as you mentioned, Durham to be the special counsel to you know, engage in a long-term probe of the origins of the Russia investigation. Maybe that would mollify the president. Maybe he, those thing, things were timed on the same day. And it's also possible that you know, faced with uh, information about a, a probe of uh, wrongdoing at the at the White House, that would be all the more reason why the Attorney General would feel the need to come clean and say, "Look, you know, there's nothing there's nothing here regarding a reason to doubt the integrity of this uh, election," or it could be coincidence. We just we just really don't know. You know, uh, in a few seconds, we're going to be talking with uh, a journalist who wrote a piece in the Atlantic about. Um, what we may soon learn about Trump um, post-presidency, and it won't be pretty. In terms of legal exposure, uh, taking even the federal, taking the pardon out of play here for federal crimes, we already know that the New York State AG, as well as the Manhattan DA, um, they're waiting uh, for a private citizen, Trump. Is it possible, uh, from at least the former federal prosecutor friends I have, they say, we don't know what might have been funneled to the Southern District or to the Eastern District um, as part um, of the probe uh, that led to, um, you know, the, the report. T to that end, how much exposure do you think Trump and family have post-presidency, even with pardons? Quite a lot, I would think. I mean, even if there were broad pardons issued that took all the federal charges off the table, uh, as you already pointed out, the Manhattan District Attorney is already investigating uh, Trump for uh, state tax violations. Uh, both the local prosecutors and the state New York State Attorney General's office uh, may have grounds to do further criminal investigations regarding both the, the uh, Trump organization, um, you know, the, the Trump Foundation, misuse of supposedly charitable uh, contributions, uh, state campaign finance uh, reporting problems, the Trump University a fraud, and that's not to mention civil liability for anything ranging from any of the number of sexual assault accusations, including uh, one right now that's that's currently pending. So you know there are a lot of potential uh, vulnerabilities and exposure, both criminal and uh, civil, on the state level for Trump and all his you know, senior family members, people who were the head. Uh, actors within the Trump organization, even putting aside all the federal charges that would become moot after a pardon. And even if the pardons are exercised, if it turns out we learn that there was self-dealing um, by the president uh, in that he directed business uh, to Trump properties or that, um, for example, that there was uh, government contracts um, were improperly funneled to certain contractors. Would the pardon waive that away, um, or could those be more in the civil realm here where he'd have to make repayments? Well, that's a good question, because I was about to say that if the uh, pardon, hypothetical pardon, were broadly worded enough, it would reach criminal liability. You know, there are things, uh, the Honest Services Act and uh, bribery and other types of corruption federal statutes that could be involved in that kind of situation. Those would all be covered by the pardon. But uh, civil liability, you know, a, a, a suit uh, for repayment, you know, reimbursement of the, of the money, um, I guess that's, that's not off the table. Finally, um, the right thing to do. Um, it's interesting. I think the, the Ford pardon of Nixon um, with the realm of the benefit of history, historians tend to look more fondly on it, that it was time to move past that as a nation. At the time, they, many people obviously felt differently. Joe Biden has seemingly indicated to say, listen, I'm not going to tell my DOJ what to do, um, but if it's up to me, I'd rather just turn the next chapter. And that frustrates a lot of folks in his own party. But do you think if we had the benefit of history, it's time to move on? I think there's actually a big difference between the, the Ford-Nixon situation and the current one. Back then, uh, Nixon was chastened. Um, he did not make a lot of public appearances. Um, the, everyone kind of thought that the disgrace of being forced from office, uh, forced to resign in disgrace, maybe was punishment enough. You don't have that here. You have a, a current president who is absolutely not at all remorseful, um, if anything is uh, defiant. 
and um, I think would see the, the lack of charges as a vindication and would trumpet it as a vindication, arguably exacerbating the disrespect for the rule of law that we've already had. So I, I see the, the, the two lessons as being very, very different. And um, I, would, I would personally think that in terms of respect for the rule of law and deterring future presidential or other official misconduct in the future, we need to be very careful about just completely wiping the entire slate clean. I happen to agree with you, and I also think because there wasn't an imagining of a President Trump uh, or what that person would do uh, to the office of the presidency, we need to rethink maybe some limits um, and maybe um, oversight as well. But uh, that for another day. Steve Mulroy, thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Thank you. All right, folks, when we come back, I'll bring in a congressman from California who's also an ER doctor. He's got a unique perspective. He'll talk about the stalemate over the round of stimulus and also how the COVID vaccine can and should be distributed. We'll get into that and more after this.